morning, everyone. Uh, well, this is the third day and the day after the dinner, so um, it means maybe that some people will come in late, but we will uh, um, ask them to come in from that side, so uh, hopefully they will not uh, um, uh, make too much uh, interruptions. Oh, <laughs> right. Okay. Um, Today I'd like to introduce you to our third keynote speaker of uh, this conference, and I have to put up my glasses here. <laughs> Professor, I'm very happy to introduce you to Professor Ji Hyun Lim, uh, who uh, is a professor of history and uh, the director of a research center called RICH, Research Institute of Comparative History and Culture at Hanyang University in Seoul, South Korea. Um, Ji Hyun has uh, really had a long and illustrious career and has had uh, a very international uh, range of, of uh, interests uh, and he has had visiting pos positions uh, both in Europe as well as in um, uh, other places around the world. Uh, for, and mostly in Eastern Europe, which is quite interesting, in Krakow, Warsaw, and places like that. Uh, he has written numerous books and articles on comparative history of nationalist movements, the social, socio-cultural history of Marxism in East Asia and Eastern Europe, and issues of memory, colonialism, and dictatorship in East Asia. Uh, he recently, or a few years ago, he was the recipient of a very large Korean uh, Research Foundation grant to develop uh, what he calls uh, a program in transnational humanities uh, to overcome, really, the nationalist uh, bias in a lot of history writing. And uh, in that context, uh, he is going to talk about victimhood nationalism History, Reconciliation, and Transnational Asia today. So, Ji Hin Lim, he will speak about 40 minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ian, and then all the organizers and staffs who made it possible for us to have this occasion to talk to one another and so on. So, the time is barely running out, so I will go straight to my talk. Okay, and um, let me start with uh, some terminological remarks. And then these, each language has a different meaning so about the victimhood and the sacrifice. So for example, the German word of offer or Polish word of ofiara has a double meanings. Actually, offer or ofiara has a connotation of both victims and sacrifice, but in in, in ancient Latin, so victima un sac, uh, sacrificium, or in English, victim and sacrifice can be divided into two different meanings. And the, the, for example, if victim means a person subjected to oppression and suffering and injury, and it's a sort of, how can I say, some passive, passive object, the, the subjected to the injury inflicted by others, Sacrifice is a more active agency. I mean, a living being sacrificed to some deity. And actually, in East Asian languages, also we can differentiate between victim and sacrifice. In Korean, hisengja, is, uh, if hisengja equals sacrifice, piheza means a victim. And Chinese, also same, the Chinese characters we are using, and, and Japanese, giseisha and higaisha. So, when, in, when I write this in English, I use the term of victim of nationalism, but when I write this in Korean or in Japanese, I prefer the term of hisengja ishik minjokjui or giseisha ishikuno nationalism. Means that, in a sense, this nationalism, victim of nationalism appears on the scene exactly at the moment when the victim is sublimed into sacrifice. So in a sense, this victim of nationalism is not the right word, or sacrifice nationalism is neither right, right word. So this victim of nationalism exists in between victims and sacrifice, or more exactly speaking, it is exists on the way from the victim to the 
to the to the sacrifice. So in this sublime process, can we locate this victim of nationalism? So actually, if you this is also very closely related with the Christian martyrdom tradition. In in medieval period, one can find pro domino mori, right? It's so people's willingness to die for the sake of God. But in the modern world, this pro domino mori is changed into pro patria mori. It's a willingness to die for the state, willingness to die for the, the nation or for the fatherland. So in this sense, this um, nationalism as a political religion, I think this, uh, the, uh, the character of nationalism as a political religion can be spot in this victim of nationalism very well. And for example, the, this actually is civil religion, and secular religion, and political religion. It's a term that Jean Jacques Rousseau advised to the Poles in order to the escape from the national crisis. You should establish national religion or political religion, of, which means you should adore nation instead of God. So I mean that this is we, we, one, one can call the political religion or secular religion. And this victim of nationalism represents this uh, religious character of this uh, the nationalism. For example, Yaskuni is a typical example, but this is uh, If you go to National Cemetery in Seoul, Dongjak uh, Dong, you can find the, 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 the bridge who is named Jungkook Kyo. But if one pronunciate this Jungkook Kyo in Japanese, it's Yasukuni Bashi, right? So Yasukuni is not the typical Japanese peculiar phenomenon, but rather it's a sort of the, the East Asia, how the East Asia and the political elites got the, uh, this concept of uh, related with the national religion from the Chinese classics. So actually, Jungkook Kyo this in the Korean National Cemetery was named by the vice president in the uh, Korean government under the Lee Seung Man's presidency since 1958. So, and also in Poland, for example, the 19th century intellectual historical tradition always talked about the Poland Polish nation as a crucified nation, right? It is related uh, the nationalism related with the Christian tradition of martyrdom and something like that. And also after the reunification of both, both Germanys, Neue Wache was uh, the restructured by the, under the Kohl government. And they put the, uh, this uh, enlarged version of this uh, Kete Kolwitz uh, sculpture of the Pieta. And Pieta is, uh, you know, yesterday the, the Prasenjit, uh, they showed us a Chinese version of Pieta, and this is German version of Pieta, but it, it has a very delicate, you know, meaning that, okay, uh, these soldiers, this Neue Wache was dedicated to the victims or fallen soldiers or all the killed during the Second World War, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, or some which part of Germany or so on. And then, but the, when these guys put the Pieta the, made by the uh, Ketekovic in Neue Wache, it has a very significant meaning that to represent those fallen soldiers as uh, victims and something like that, or more than victims, I mean that the sort of sublime of uh, sublime the victims, right? And also very interesting, this uh, Urakami Hansai said, this is Urakami Tenshudo, it's a Urakami Catholic Church in Nagasaki. Actually, atomic bomb was exploded uh, the, o over the Urakami, Urakami uh, the Catholic Church. And this Nagai Takashi, the, he's the, the, uh, the Japanese doctor, medical doctor, and also he was um, uh, this Catholic, Catholic and the, he wrote the Battle of Nagasaki in 1949. In this uh, sort of a book dedicated to the victims of atomic bomb in Nagasaki, he used the term of Hansai. Hansai is a Japanese translation of Holocaust, right? So I mean that the, the term of Holocaust was used in Nagasaki even before the the, the usage of Holocaust in Israel and Poland. Nowadays, the Jewish Institute of History in Warsaw and the Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, they are competing over the position who used the Holocaust for the first time. 
But it seems to me this Nagasaki, the Japanese guy, Japanese medical doctor who used the term of Holocaust for the first time. And also, this is Maximilian Kolbe, uh, the Polish, Polish Catholic priest who worked as a missionary in Nagasaki in 1930s. And he sacrificed himself in order to save the other inmates in the, the concentration camp of Auschwitz. So he was uh, secularized by the John Paul II in the early 1980s, but also a very problematic figure because he was a typical anti-Semite, right? But the, despite that he was an anti-Semite, he was secularized by the John Paul II. So there was a little bit the underground debate in Poland about the, if this is the right thing to secularize Maximilian Kolbe or, or not. But well, despite that, anyway, this guy was uh, secularized. So this is just a, the historical coincidence, and but very symptomatic of the to show the very symptomatic example to show how the victim or sacrifice has been worked in the different historical contexts. Okay, then the it's a sort of genealogy of the my way of. Uh, thinking which arrived to this idea of victim of nationalism. As a historian whose um, area field is Poland, in the 1990s, I have traced some Polish debates about the victimhood in Polish modern and contemporary history. And the Czesław Miłosz, this guy is a Polish poet who got the Nobel Prize in 1980. So actually, I was suspicious of him because the 1980 was the year when the Solidarity Movement broke out. So I thought of Cold War politics stands behind the fact that this guy, Chesov Miyoshi, got the Nobel Prize in 1980, exactly. So, but after reading some of his poems, I became his fan, especially this Campo di Fiori. Campo di Fiori is the, the, the name of square in Rome, right? And the, in the Renaissance period, this Renaissance, uh, the humanist Giordano Bruno was born to death in this, uh, the, uh, the square of Campo di Fiori. But in this poem, the Chess of Miłosz showed that how the ordinary the Roman citizens just passed the, the, the site where the, uh, the Renaissance humanist Bruno was born to death as if nothing happened. And then, he made an analogy of this, uh, the Polish citizens in 1943, when the uh, Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto are killed by the Nazi Germans, but the, how the Polish Warsaw citizens were enjoying holidays, they were enjoying this, what's, what is this, um, a merry-go-round on, on, on Sunday. So in this way, Czesław Miłosz raised the question of Polish attitude toward their neighbors, of course, Poles were not guilty. They did not kill the Jews, but is it really uh, the morally or, or, or ethically, uh, uh, the, how can I say, we can say that Poles are not just guilty. What, some, some, what about the Catholic religious sins? What about the shame? And this guy, this, this Jan Dwonski, the second guy, is a literary critic. She wrote a very, very important essay in 1987, whose title is Ghetto. It's a poor Poles looking at ghetto. It's the, actually the title of poem by Czesław Miłosz. And, but in this essay that was published in the Polish Catholic uh, Weekly, The Golden Hip of Czechny, this Jan Bluanski raised the question, okay, the, under the Nazi rule, any poll who tried to hide the Jews in their homes. They could be executed if, if Nazi Germans detected these Poles were hiding Jews, right? It's a really harsh condition. So no one can they point the fingers to Poles who did not hide or who did not save the lives of Jews. So Poles are not guilty of those Holocaust. Poles are not legally culpable for those things that happened, but the Jan Bronski raised a question of shame and sins. It means that we are totally free from the Holocaust, that tragedy. Of course, we, we had to you know, stake our, our lives at stake if we really try to save Jews. So 
Many of Paul was just indifferent to what happening, what was happening in Poland, but can it justify Pol Polish indifference to the really tragic, uh, some, some tragedies of the Jews uh, in Poland had to come from? And this essay provoked lots of controversies and debates among Poles, especially the main, main argument was that, so then what could we do? We were most victimized nation during the Second World War. Then you are now pointing fingers to us? No, we, we, we are innocent. That was the main argument, but still this uh, Jan Bronski and then uh, the Zygmunt Bauman, uh, this, uh, they joined in this debate and argument, okay, we are not guilty, but the fact that we are not guilty never means that we are free from these tragedies. So as a Catholic, perhaps we might think of our sins, right? Also, we should think of our shames rather than national pride. So in, under these circumstances and this, um, still, if you, if you visit the homepage of the Catholic Weekly, the Golden Book of Sheini, still the, the debates are, are going on. And some young generation, of course, are now still writing something, comments, and so on. And then this is, the really, really, really shocking thing was the, the book Song Shiaz that was written, published uh, by Jan Gross in the year 2000. So actually, before that, Poles were regarded as victims, right? After that, in Jan Bronski and the Church of Mirsch's poems, Poles became bystanders who just, uh, just you know, with, with uh, their arms um, folding and they just looked at the, 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 the killing of Jews. Then, Song Shiaz, this is a very tragic accident in a small village called Yedvavna in 1941. So th in the 1941, July, um, about more or, le more or less between 800 and 1,200 Jews were massacred in that small village in Yedvavna. And it has been known that it was Nazi Germans who perpetrated, who killed Jews. But Jan Gross, excavated this accident and he revealed that it was not Nazi Germans, but the Polish, Polish neighbors who killed the Jews in this small Yedvavne. This is, Song Shiaz means neighbors, right? The title was neighbors, so it means that it was neighbors who killed those Jews. It really, the, it, it brought a sort of earth, intellectual earthquake to the whole Polish society in the year 2000. There was no even single day without mentioning this Holocaust. So all the Polish newspapers and press was obsessed with the you know, and so on because they were really perplexed at that. They became perpetrators. They always regarded themselves as most victimized nation during the Second World War, but suddenly they found themselves as perpetrators like not Germans so Poles were really, really embarrassed at the fact that some of them were perpetrators. And then in the year 2002, I had a rather long interview with Zygmunt Bauman for the Korean journal Dangdae Bipyeong. And in my conversation with Zygmunt Bauman, I found his term, the hereditary victim, was very, very interesting. And Zygmunt Bauman was a Polish Jew and who was a sociology professor at Warsaw University. But in 1968, when the Polish Communist Party initiated anti-Zionist campaign, he was expelled from the party. So he emigrated to Israel in 1968, but he found Israel is really frustrating society. So after one year, the, he published a very critical comments on the Israel society, then he went to Leeds University, right? And then in this um, intellectual turmoil, he found that concept of hereditary victimhood to analyze how on earth or why those uh, Jews who were victimized during the Second World War through Holocaust could really victimize those Palestinians. Right? And he tried to make analysis of this uh, the, uh, Jewish uh, Zionist shift from victims to victimizers uh, through the concept of uh, the, um, the hereditary victim. 
And then I tried in the year 2003, uh, apply this concept to the uh, critical analysis of nationalist historiography in Korea and East Asia in general. Then I found, yes, this is really interesting. And the concept also, why, for example, post post-Second World War generation in South Korea regard themselves as victims. Physically, they could not be victims, right? Because they were born after the end of colonial rule, but still they regard themselves as the victims by the Japanese colonial rule, like Jews or Israelis who were born after 1945 regard themselves as victims of Holocaust. And this sort of hereditary victimhood in a sense, a very, a very crucial conceptual tool to, get, to lead us to a critical analysis of contemporary victim of nationalism in both countries. Then in the, in the 2002, Quinto Grass published a very, uh, the well-known provo provoking novel, Im Krebsgang, right? It's, a, it's, it's about the uh, German civilians on the, the ship of Kustulov which was torpedoed by the Red Army's submarine. And so about, about 9,000 German civilians were killed by this torpedo attack. And but I will talk to you later about this. And then 2007 in Seoul, I found a very, very interesting um, uh, phenomenon. means that 2007, January 18, four major Korean newspapers began to criticize Yoko Kawashima Watkins on the same day so simultaneously, and this uh, press is uh, from the left one, Hangyore Moon, to the right one, the Joseon Ilbo. So regardless of their uh, political orientation, all those Korean major newspapers began to criticize Yoko Kashima Wakin's book, although this book was translated into Korean and published in the year 2005. I find it, this is very strange, and then it's quite clear. Because when I visited the Boston Globe, the uh, January 16, at the Korean General Consul in Boston area sent a protest email, protest the, the letter to the uh, Ministry of Education in Massachusetts. And uh, in that, she protested against the uh, Ministry of Education Massachusetts decision to include Yoko Kawashima Watkins' book in the reading list for the, this, uh, the Massachusetts high schools. And this Yoko Kawashima Wakin's, Wakin's book, The So Far Away from Bamboo Group, is a typical Hikage story. And then when it was published in 2005, Korean newspapers read, published, uh, book reviews read a lukewarmly positive, right? Or positively lukewarm, uh, these book reviews, but suddenly 2007, there was a simultaneous, very well concerted attack against this book, and then the why I will explain later. Okay, then third point is perhaps transnational or transnationality <coughs> of victim of nationalism. This convolution of entangled histories is come from the ENR when when EM made an analysis of this Indonesian Chinese victim of, and then this is really very, very interesting term. And actually, this, uh, in order to uh, the understand the victim of nationalism on the transnational space or on the global space, it is really important and crucial to understand the theme from the angle of transnational history or entangled histories of the past of victimized and victimizers. Means that the I think that the most frequent mis misunderstanding of nationalism is that nationalism is national. But nationalism is not national at all. Nationalism has been always transnational because nationalist imagination could be possible only on the interspace between nations, right? So victim of nationalism in this sense also typical transnational character that is inherent to nationalisms. And the Adam Michnig, a Polish essayist and the journalist, summed up this uh, victim of nationalism, so a victim of debate, like this, a distasteful competition over who suffered most could be found in this uh, uh, transnational debate on the victim. And then 
this can be uh, classified uh, into three points. The, the, the really terrible thing is politics of numbering. Okay, how many people were dead there? Okay, we, we, in, in Korea we have, for example, five million people were dead. But in your country only three million were dead. This sort of politics of numbering, reduction to the numbers, regardless of the victim's viewpoint, it can be found very interesting. And also, this is an East Asian case, for example, when Iris Chang the, published her book, she insisted on the uh, 300,000 victims numbers, right? And I didn't understand why this uh, 3,000 hundreds is important, but Joshua Fogel, he revealed very interestingly that these 300,000 numbers are slightly more than the numbers of victims in, in Nagasaki plus Hiroshima. So in a sense, this sort of politics of numbering stands behind this sort of uh, uh, the calculation of numbers of victims. The second point is hierarchization of victims. For example, Japanese, the, 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 the victim of debate narrative regards themselves the, the, the victims of the Nagasaki and Hiroshima as war victims. But for example, sometimes colonial victims, as the, the position of colonial victims is lower than the, uh, the position of war victims by some. For Watanabe, Shoichi is a really terrible guy, and then he talks about these victims of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. It's a question of human rights. While, the, for example, comfort to women's case is a sort of a product of production of commercial act. And also, for example, in United States case, they put an emphasis of the suffering or victimization of the prisoners of wars of America rather than Asian victims that were victimized by the Japanese colonial atrocities. And also in Eastern Europe, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there has been always debates of which part of uh, victimization is greater or bigger. For example, victimized by the Gulag, Stalinism, or victimized by the Auschwitz. So Gulag and Auschwitz are competing over the who really, whose victim of this more, more grotesque or something like that. And also the, in the Cold War era, for example, in East Germany, they never talked about fair tribing. Fair tribing is, uh, is, is, is the East European version of Hikiage, right? Because fair tribing, if East Germany, East German guys are talking about fair tribing, then they should, critical, they should be critical of these socialist brother countries like Poland and Czechoslovakia and Soviet Union. So they did use the term of umzitlung. It means resettlement. Instead of fair tribing, they used a very euphemistic term of umzitlung and resettlement, while they were very critical of bomb, bombing, allied bombing, because this is the imperialist intentional killing of innocent Germans. So in, in the East Germany, this, um, the focus was put on the, the allied bombing, while in, in the West Germany, the focus has been put on the, for example, fair tribe and the expellation of ordinary Germans who was expelled by the Soviet Union, Red Army, and, and so on, so on. And also the German prisoners of war in Siberia. They were suffered from the Stalinist cruelty or atrocities, something like that. Also, some, some Zionist scholars said that explicitly wrote the, the Holocaust or killing of Jews was a terrible human tragedy, while the killing of Romas was a, a sort of a solution of social question, social problem. And these sort of things, and they quite often in the everyday lives, on the everyday press, one can find this sort of hierarchization of victims. And also now, nowadays, neo-Nazis are using this hierarchization of victims only victimized by, by Hitler and Auschwitz are real victims, and we, Germans who were victimized by Stalinist atrocities, we are not victims. 
There is no hierarchization of victim, victims. That's the slogan of some new neo-Nazis in East German, East German area. So this is really a very much context-bound, complicated uh, situation is, um, can be found. And thirdly, one can find also nationalization of victims. The, in Poland, there is a, such a saying, dead Jews make good Poles. They were actually, those Jews were suffered from the anti-Semitism, but only when they were dead, as with the Polish citizenship, then they can be counted as Poles. Right, so so-called six million Polish victims actually includes three million Polish victims, three million Jews. But when these, these, uh, these guys are talking about the numbers of victims, only when at that moment those Jews can be integrated into the Polish nation as Polish victims, something like that. So, and also Bush's uh, funeral address after September 11 explicitly shows that one third of those victims by the, uh, the uh, September 11 attack were not Americans, right? They were waiters and they, they were some marginalized, the, the underclasses who were working in the, this Twin Tower building. But in Bush's funeral address, suddenly it's an attack against the American nation. So in this funeral address, those guys suddenly got the American citizenship after their deaths. And so these sort of things can be found quite often in the debates about victim of nationalism. And the Korean Victims Memorial in Hiroshima actually was located outside Hiroshima, the, uh, the Peace Memorial Park. Only in 1999, this memorial uh, could be located within the park, that, although there were some, still some debates. But I'll skip this. And then, also, in order to understand this transnationality of uh, victim of nationalism, also, I think the one needs to understand the antagonistic complicity of nationalisms. I mean that, for example, the history textbook controversy or some some controversy over our own national territory, how this sort of um, the contemporary nationalist antagonism actually contributes much to justifying victim of nationalism on the transnational space. For example, Erika Steinbach, she is a terrible, she's a, she says she's a historian, but she's a, a sort of chairperson of those uh, Bunt der Affair Trieben, and it means that the Association of German Expellees. So she's a sort of amateur historian, but if one visits the Polish newspaper, Gazeta Wyborcza, her name appears more than 200 times. So whenever she has a certain, you know, very provoking remarks about the German expellees, and she classifies German, you know, Poles as the perpetrators, and all those remarks are immediately translated into Polish and published in Polish newspapers. And in this way, Erika Steinbach, in a sense, helps very much this, uh, the consolidation of Polish nationalist discourse. And also in this way, the very strengthened Polish nationalist discourse also contribute to justifying this Erika Steinbach-like German new nationalism and so on. Okay, and then, so, uh, if one has a look at the uh, historical culture or historical narrative immediately after the Second World War, I think one can find rather it was hero ship, national hero ship, which has been dominant in the nationalist discourse in Korea and Israel and so on. But suddenly, one can find the shift uh, of this nationalist discourse from the hero ship to the victim of. From when? I'm not sure, but I think that the, for example, trial of Ahiman in Jerusalem was one of those turning points. But the mainly, perhaps after the fall of the second, fall of the Berlin Wall, suddenly this, the collapse of Cold War opened the way to the formation of a sort of a global public sphere or global memory community. And then, with the formation of this sort of global public sphere, one can find a certain shift of the nationalist discourse from the hero ship into the victimhood. So certain transposition of Holocaust memory to contemporary genocide can be found 
uh, quite so rampantly. And then some guys talk about this human rights regime, in a sense also contributed to the formation of these victimhood, uh, victimhood uh, discourses. And also in, in the same context, one can find the politics of apology, of, for example, Japanese internment camp and colonial massacres and stolen children in, in, in Australia. Also, it's very interesting, in the year 2000, January 2000, there was a European Union summit meeting in Stockholm. And for the first time, perhaps, in the human history of mankind, those political leaders articulated and made it explicit it's a precondition of East European countries to join the European Union they should put the education of the Holocaust in their curriculum. So for the first time, these political leaders and premiers and presidents, right, they specify the education of Holocaust is a precondition of those uh, East European countries to enter the uh, European Union. So anyway, they, in this sort of political move within the European Union also, I think, helped very much to the rise of this victim of discourse and so on. Also, so these two human rights regimes and the formation of the global public sphere and then this, uh, uh, the um, politics of apology perhaps might be classified into the certain move towards the deterritorializing memories, right? Denationalizing memories. But on the other hand, this, this sort of move also contributed to re-territorializing memories or re-nationalizing memories. For example, long-distance nationalism or diaspora nationalism. This, this on, in the Korean debates about the Yoko Kawashima Watkins' book stands the This is Parents for Accurate Asian History Education. That was formed by the Korean Americans who are really very well upper middle class guys. And they began to raise the question about this Yoko Kashima Watkins because they, when their children were reading this Yoko Kashima Watkins, and then they began to be bullied by their classmates. Because in the Yoko Kashima Watkins, his Kikyagi stories, Koreans are described as perpetrators because they were attacking these Japanese police, Japanese returnees uh, on their home, way home. And then Japanese are, are, are described as the victims. Right? So these Korean Americans were really angry at this sort of reversal of positions. And they began to raise a question about this. And it, they had a connection with this. Uh, Korean general consul in, in Boston area. And so this criticism of, against the Yoko Kawashima Watkins Hikiyage story began in the uh, United States, especially by the, uh, the Korean American community. And so the so Nanjing, oh my god, OK. So just one thing I can say that there's quite a lot of parallels between Holocaust and their own victimhood. For example, in Japanese case, Izaya Bandasang, so, so Nihonjin to Yudaijin des. This is a really interesting and a very, very representative uh, wording. The how those people, even Germans, 1950s Germans, victimhood discourse always regard themselves as uh, with uh, in 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 a power with the Jewish. Uh, the, the victims by the Holocaust and so on. Okay, this Morris Papong is also a very interesting case because he was a chief of Vichy police and when he was standing on the trial in France, this, his, his defend, defending lawyer was a communist lawyer in the French Communist Party and this guy, his lawyers defending uh, the strategy is to pick up his work as a uh, the prefect of pa uh, the Paris police, and he killed these Algerian immigrants uh, demonstrators in 1961. But French court did not include this, his killing of Algerian immigrants uh, for his trial. Only the, his contribution to the uh, arrest of those Jews was 
uh, the, the, the part of this indictment, the, the crime against humanity. But killing of uh, Algerian immigrants was not a part of crime of, against humanity. This is very intriguing how this in Western Europe also this Holocaust, uh, the controversy of Holocaust things has been worked out as a certain, how can I say, some also sort of uh, orientalist version of victim of discourses in Western Europe can be found. Okay, quick. Okay, sacralization of memory. For example, whenever I, I met the Poles on the pub or, or in, in, in the train, we, we talked about this and then they asked me, what are you doing here? I'm, 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 I'm studying Polish history. Are you studying Polish history? No. You can never ever understand our own tragic history, right? <laughs> this is a colloquial, colloquial terms of this uh, secularization of memory, but most sophisticated form is perhaps the, uh, the Holocaust uniqueness discourse. It's a very unique one. So you are non-Jew? No, you can never ever understand what the Holocaust means. This is blocking the other's approach to one's own history, and perhaps some of you who are working on the Asian history, you might have uh, the similar experiences in, in, in your field and so on. Okay, and also this Rankian positivism, so for example, when these conservative historians began to interrogate witnesses of comfort to women or Holocaust victims, they began to use the Rankian positivism to construct nonsense. Oh, this witness is nonsense. She doesn't understand exactly what the date it was and so on. So this sort of uh, the historian's interrogation and versus witness can be found also in this. And, but witness is also sometimes dangerous. Sometimes it often leads this witness discourses into sort of melodramatic aesthetics that can be found among the Jewish witnesses and so on. So just like uh, Oprah Winfrey style, some confession, and how could I overcome these sufferings and how could I become, you know, such a good person, so? Okay, collective guilt and innocence. How, ma how many minutes do I have? Well, three to okay. Um, it's also very complicated ones, um, but just one thing I want to say is that in German case, these uh, new Turkish immigrants who began to arrive in Germany, they were totally excluded from the German's way of coming to terms with the Nazi past. Also, you are newcomers, you were in Turkey at the time, so you are not responsible for Holocaust, right? So only we ethnic Germans are responsible for the Holocaust, and, but in this way, this German so-called German version of Yoshin Dekina Shishkijin, or conscientious intellectuals, ethnicized, right? They ethnicized, they are coming to terms with the past in the name of conscience and in the name of progress, in the name of the, 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 the left intellectuals. So these sort of things is really complicated one, but in, in German case, some Turkish immigrants began to be involved in the coming to terms with the past Holocaust. And they organized some excursion or some historical tour toward Auschwitz. And there is a very interesting the documentary about those Muslim mothers who visited Auschwitz. And then on the other way around, they began to reflect on the massacre of Armenians in Turkey. So in this way, they began to rupture this ethnicized, ethnicized German way of uh, coming to terms with the past. On the other hand, also, they began to raise the question about their own mother country, home country in Turkey, the massacre of uh, Armenians. But I'm not sure, for example, in Australia. So new Asian immigrants who came to Australia in 1970s or 1980s, how can these, these new immigrants be involved in the Australian way of coming to terms with the past of those uh, stolen generations, stolen children. I think it, we can find a very interesting some precedents uh, from those German, Turkish German immigrant groups and their way of involving, uh, being involved in the Germans uh, coming to terms with the past. 
Okay, this is a really important one, <laughs> but how can, I, how can I do? So, okay, just one thing. The, let, me, let me make a comparison between uh, Yoko Kawashima Watkins and Quinto Gross. For example, in Yoko Kawashima Watkins, she never mentioned about why her family could live they lived in the northern part of Korean Peninsula. She never mentioned about the Japanese colonial rule in those books. But when Günther Grass talking about those German civilian victims, she did not forget to mention that the Gustloff, this is the, the name of the Nazi commissioner in Switzerland, and Gustloff is the ship that was used by the Nazis for the project of the uh, strength through joy to, it's a sort of, uh, how can I say, some policy of bribing workers uh, for, the, for the foreign travels of, abroad. And also the, the very complicated multi-layered history is uh, written in the Krebsgang, for example. Okay, many of those Germans in the ost Preussen, they were supporters of Hitler's. So the Quintergras did not forget to mention that these, these, these victims also accomplices of Nazi rule and they were supporters of Nazis and so they were perpetrators. So perpetrators plus and victims, these uh, some different positions are overlapped in the Quinto Grass, the novel, novella in Krebsgang, while Yoko Gashima Watkins, that is really good building roman for young lower teen boys and girls, but she just totally, totally forget to mention this about the historical context about the Japanese hikyage. So, this is a sort of a decontextualization de and over-contextualization can be found. For example, Laudansky brothers, who killed the Jews in Yedvabne in, in the 1941. In an interview after the book, they, they said, oh, we were victims, like uh, all other Poles. We suffered from the Nazi rule, we suffered from the communist rule, and so on. So although those guys killed Jews in Yedvabne, the, you know, amazingly, they could define themselves as victims. Also, Korean Presidential Committee of the Historical Truth and Reconciliation wrote a certain report. In the report, they argued that the Korean war criminals, and the, after the, the, the military uh, the tribunal, and then executed the Korean war tribunals, were victims by the Japanese rule. And this sort of metamorphosis of perpetual individual perpetrators into victims can, could be possible in this uh, logic of victim of nationalism. And uh, we can find uh, lots of examples about this. OK. Oh, what can I do? OK. Finally, this, uh, the, from the viewpoint of the historical epistemology, I think victim of nationalism also very problematic because it negates historical actors, right? By making those people uh, passive victims, they totally negate the role of historical agency or historical actors. And for example, uh, Germans and Austrians, they co have competed for the position of who were the Hitler's first victims. And nowadays, the, after the fair tribunal debates, some of the Spiegel guys uh, wrote a very interesting article, Hitler's last victim, and there was the Germans who expelled from East Preussen, and they are, they are described as Hitler's last victims. Of course, the ordinary innocent Japanese were the first victims by the Japanese bad uh, military rulers and something like that. So these sort of things can be found also, this agency and the passive objects of history, which can be found in the victim of um, discourses. Okay, okay, I will stop.